All right, welcome to Food System Solutions Taking Action. In this presentation, I'll focus on what to do and why it's probably a good idea. Just to refresh your memory, I think I can summarize part one with this cartoon. I wouldn't say the ship is sinking, but the mast is broken. We're out of food and water. Sharks are circling and the captain is insane. We have a food system that exploits workers, ignores ecological externalities, abuses animals, all while underproducing nutritious foods and overproducing ultra processed foods that drive chronic diseases. And this is a problem. Before we get to the good news, I have a bit more bad news. And the bad news is this, the vast majority of people have no idea that the food choices they make each day influence everything I talked about in part one and the disconnect between people and food production only continues to grow, especially in developed countries. Don't believe me? You must not be familiar with the 2017 survey indicating the surprising number of American adults who think chocolate milk comes from brown cows. 7% of American adults think chocolate milk comes from brown cows. For the record, it does not. I formally apologize on behalf of all Americans. You laugh, but it's not much better in the UK where four in 10 adults can't differentiate between a mango and an apple. Humans tend to buy food based on routine and unconscious mental patterning rather than logical thinking. We're constantly bombarded with food marketing. We don't get fair education about nutrition and the environment in school. In the end, if a food is affordable, accessible, tastes good, and we won't be ridiculed for eating it, there's a very good chance that we'll buy it and eat it. Here's the good news. Farmers grow what governments incentivize and what consumers demand. Or put a little bit more simply, what we buy and eat drives food production. So there's hope. If we change, the system changes. Maybe you don't believe me. Take a look at the Twinkie. Several years ago, Hostess threatened to get rid of the Twinkie and what happened? People joined forces, people signed petitions, people raised money, they changed behaviors. We saved the Twinkie. The food system can't change unless eaters change, and this change needs to be shaped by clear evidence and form guidelines, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I am going to cover five major dietary adjustments that can help shape a more sustainable food future. Five adjustments are find your minimal effective dose of animal products and be selective about where they come from, minimize wasted food, support sustainable farms, eat a wider variety of minimally processed foods, and minimize single-use plastics. You might see these adjustments and think that I'm putting 100% of the burden onto individual eaters on planet Earth, but that's not the case. These dietary adjustments can be incorporated at various levels. At the individual level, which I mentioned, we can make food and lifestyle changes, great, but also we can incorporate these in terms of technological innovation. We can generate plant-based meats. We can expand on precision agriculture. We can develop apps for farmers and how they irrigate. We can expand on genetically engineered crops that withstand drought. We can expand on legislation. We can develop farm subsidies that support the most regenerative farmers. We can hold industrial animal agriculture responsible for pollution. There's bottom-up advocacy. College students can demand that their cafeterias have better options, and there's top-down advocacy. Celebrity chefs can educate people about how to cook tofu on Instagram. Before I outline these five adjustments in more detail, I need to offer two caveats. First, sustainable food production is extremely complex. And the more I learn about it, the more complex it becomes. When you see a tweet or an article or an infographic about sustainable food production, it's a few words on a page, a few images on a page, trying to describe the vast interconnected web of the natural world. It's tough to sum up the natural world on TikTok or via in infographic. People have tried and it gets a little bit unwieldy, as you can see here. How do we approach this complexity? Do we just throw up our hands and curse the food system gods? We can, but I've adopted a different approach. I've adopted the Wendell Berry approach. The trick is not to find certainty, but to act thoughtfully with partial knowledge. We don't know everything, but we know enough to act thoughtfully. Second caveat, when I'm talking about truly sustainable eating, I'm not just talking about 
carbon footprints and water pollution. I'm talking about ensuring the well-being of the planet and all beings on it, including us, workers, and animals. Okay, those are my caveats. With that out of the way, let's get into adjustment number one. Find your minimal effective dose of animal products and be selective about where they come from. In all of my investigation and research, I've discovered that how much we can benefit the environment and the food system through our eating mostly hinges on the amount of animal products we consume. And this really comes down to inputs and outputs. Livestock production requires a lot of inputs and you don't get that much beneficial stuff back out. Five countries have my back on this. Sweden, Qatar, Brazil, Germany, and Canada. They are the only five countries that have a sustainability component as part of their dietary guidelines on all five, encourage their people to eat fewer animal products. Chris Rock is one of my favorite comedians. He has a, a line in one of his older routines, a pork chop will save your life if you're starving to death. I appreciate this line because it highlights the importance of context. The complexity and necessity of livestock production varies tremendously across the world. And the idea of just eliminating animals from the agricultural equation is probably a bit overly simplistic, probably impractical for a variety of reasons. First off, livestock are very important as a source of labor on farms. They can be a critical source of manure to build soil fertility. They can ensure food security in certain parts of the world that are unable to grow certain types of crops. They are a source of economic stability for farmers. Some people might need to include animal products in their diet. And when certain types of uh, grazing practices are put into place and farmers raise their animals in a certain way, it can be very beneficial for the planet. It can sequester carbon in the soil, reduce fossil fuel inputs, and decrease water withdrawals, sustainable stuff. Two thumbs up. With all that being said, these sustainable farmers doing things right with farm animals, they can't keep up with our appetite for animal products. Folks in the UK consume about 232 kilograms of dairy per person per year and about 106 kilograms of meat and fish per person per year. How does this compare to bean intake per person per year? Well, people in the UK are consuming about seven kilograms of beans per person per year. And if you don't include Taco Bell visits between midnight and 2 a.m., this goes down to three kilos of beans. Now, that's my attempt at a that's my attempt at a joke. Doesn't doesn't really get any better than that. Our growing appetite for animal products has put us in a corner. We're now dependent upon factory farms, also known as CAFOs, C-A-F-O-S, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. CAFOs are all about intensification, producing more meat, milk, eggs, and wherever you see a dark orange or red spot on this map, that's where CAFOs are the most prevalent. 70% of animals in the UK are raised in CAFOs. And there are six main reasons why CAFOs keep me up at night. First, greenhouse gas emissions. Some researchers a few years back wanted to establish which personal choices really make a difference with greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. They looked at all sorts of notable recommendations and they found that behaviors like changing light bulbs, hang drying clothes, recycling, washing clothes in cold water, getting a hybrid, they're all worth doing, but they have a low to moderate impact. Eating a plant-based diet, however, was in the high impact category. The two food groups that contribute the most to greenhouse gas emissions in the UK diet include red meat and dairy products. Next up, water. Let's quickly review the world's fresh water supply, shall we? Out of all the water on the planet, only about 2.5% is fresh. Of this fresh water, the vast majority is either frozen or underground and we can't access it. So this leaves us with about 1% of the Earth's fresh water available for withdrawal and use by humanity. Maybe you've seen a water footprint chart like this. It shows us how much water goes into producing a calorie of a given food. So beef and farmed fish and goat and tree nuts, they're all quite high. They require a lot of water. Pulses and wheat and, root and roots and tubers, they're all quite low. They don't require a lot of water inputs. Importantly, this chart also breaks down where the water is coming from, indicated by the color of the bar. So you'll see green and blue, green water, is natural rainfall that waters the soil during the growth phase of a crop. Blue water is the piped in irrigation water that goes towards the production of a crop. There are a few reasons why we need to be really concerned about overusing blue water, the irrigation water. First off, it takes a lot of energy to pump. Water's heavy. 
The other reason is you might be diverting water from an area of the community where they need it for another reason. And then finally, when you start to drill really, really deep underground for groundwater and you use it really quickly, it can take a really long time to recharge, centuries in some cases. And depending on how far underground you're going, it might never recharge because you're changing the structures underground. One contested point with water and plant foods is that certain plant foods have a really high blue water footprint. Take a look at tree nuts, pistachios, walnuts, almonds. They tend to have a really high blue water footprint and even higher than beef in some cases. With that said, you have to consider the entirety of someone's diet. This meta-analysis indicates that reducing animal product consumption is an effective strategy to decrease not only total dietary water footprint, but specifically blue water footprint, which is the one we're a little bit more concerned with. Third, land use. Of all the land surface area on planet Earth, 71% is habitable land. And we use about half of this land for agriculture. You might be thinking, well, sure, that's a, a lot of land for agriculture, but we actually use 78% of the agricultural land for farm animals. And we're not getting that much of a return on our investment. It's a losing proposition. Right now, meat and dairy products supply only 18% of the global caloric supply and only 37% of the global protein supply. Fourth, waste. For every human alive on the planet, there are three farm animals. If aliens came to planet Earth, they'd probably think farm animals are running the show. Farm animals raised in US operations produce an estimated 335 million tons of waste annually. This is over 40 times the amount of human waste leaving US sewage treatment plants. Animal waste isn't all bad. Some of it can be valuable uh, as a source of nutrients to build soil fertility. The key word is some. Right now we have an excess of what we can use sustainably on crops. In fact, livestock farming is responsible for polluting one third of the UK water supply. Fifth, antibiotic resistance. Out of all the antibiotics produced in the world for all purposes, about two thirds are given to livestock. Here's a 20 second crash course in antibiotic resistance. When you give farm animals low dose prophylactic antibiotics, some susceptible bacteria will be eliminated. However, resistant bacteria can survive and multiply. And when you have bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics spreading to humans, that's really bad news. In the absence of urgent corrective and protective actions, the world is heading towards a post-antibiotic era in which many common infections will no longer have a cure and once again kill unabated. In order to preserve the functionality of antibiotics, we must be more strategic with how we use antibiotics in farm animals. And sixth, zoonotic disease emergence. The UN Environment Program released this report in 2020, preventing the next pandemic. And in it, they highlight these seven factors driving the emergence of zoonotic diseases, such as COVID. Increasing human demand for animal protein, unsustainable agricultural intensification, increased use and exploitation of wildlife, unsustainable utilization of natural resources, increased travel and transportation, changes in the food supply, and climate change. Five of these are quite clearly related to the food system and more specifically animal agriculture. I wanna be clear that this is a concern that extends beyond animal agriculture. Still, animal agriculture is a component we need to address moving forward. So we've come to this time where we need to ask ourselves why we're so reliant on animal products as a source of calories and nutrients when we don't need to be. And it's damaging to do so in many different ways, at least with a factory farming model. Debates around meat, can become very divisive and polarized. I always think of this in a different way. I shouldn't say always. I recently started thinking about this in a different way. I think about it in terms of responsible versus reckless animal product consumption. Reckless animal product consumption is a little bit easier to identify. I'm looking at you, Arbinator, and at you, Mitza. I think we can all agree these are excessive, unnecessary, and in environmentally reckless. Responsible animal product consumption can be a bit more nuanced, but it's still nice to have some sort of a ballpark idea of what it might look like. If we wanna raise farm animals in a closed loop sustainable model based on the current human population, it's estimated that each of us can eat about 31 kilograms of meat per year. That's about 85 grams per day. It's the size of a deck of cards. So take a minute to think about that. We're, I mean, we're all coming at it from a different angle, different upbringing. 
Some people probably think that sounds just right. Maybe it's not enough, maybe it's too much. As a point of reference, we are currently consuming more than double this amount in developed countries. While it's clear that some plant foods are more ecologically costly, the following are the most environmentally efficient sources of nutrients. Tubers, roots, seeds, legumes, groundnuts, and whole grains. Some of you might be wondering about plant-based meats. How do they fit into this sustainability equation? Uh, items like Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger, Gardein, things like that. These are plants that have been highly processed to resemble meat from animals. You grow crops like soy or peas or wheat, and then you include things like oil and spices and other additives and process it and you get a something that resembles a burger. Then there's cell-based meats. This is meat that has been grown in a lab from animal cells. This isn't taking place on a large scale yet. The first cell-based meat burger was consumed in 2013, cost $330,000. Uh, experts say it, it'll be at a more affordable price point in the next few years. When we are looking at the current evidence base around plant-based meats and cell-based meats, do they offer any benefits for public health, for environmental health, for animal welfare? Plant-based meats appear to offer some benefit. Cell-based meats, it's a little bit early to know for sure. With all that said, you can come up with scenarios where you take the worst of the worst plant-based meat and compare it to the best of the best uh, meat from a sustainable regenerative farm, and then plant-based meat all of a sudden doesn't make as much sense. I, in the end, encourage people to treat plant-based meat like meat from animals. Try to find your minimal effective dose and not build your entire diet around it. Non-dairy milks are similar. When you compare plant-based milks to factory farm dairy, it's pretty clear they have some benefits, but then you can come up with other scenarios where it's the best of the best, regenerative dairy and the worst of the worst non-dairy milks, and then it's not as clear cut. I do want to remind people here, though, that it's easy to get caught in this binary thinking with our decisions around food. We do one thing for the rest of our lives if we make the change, but there can be some benefits to cycling through different options. So maybe you have dairy one week a month. Maybe you have soy milk one week a month. Maybe you have almond milk one week a month. Maybe you have coconut milk one week a month. So you kind of rotate and get some of the benefits from all the different uh, uh, non-dairy milks and potentially dairy milks if you're, if you're including those. All right, humans are terrestrial creatures. We often focus on what's happening on the land. However, if the ocean ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So let's briefly talk about aquatic life. 90% of fish stocks are either fully fished or overfished. So we're, we're at the limit. What's driving this exploitation? There are a lot of factors, but two of the big factors include more people eating more fish. Right now, folks in the UK consume about 20 kilograms of seafood per person per year. This is expected to increase. And the other reason is lack of seafood diversification. The majority of seafood consumed in the UK is from five species, cod, haddock, tuna, salmon, prawns. This can drive exploitation of certain stocks. If we can expand the variety of our seafood species consumed, it could potentially be a more sustainable option. As a response to this wild fish exploitation, we've started more and more aquaculture, also known as fish farms. This is the fastest growing sector of animal food production. You can see on the slide that back in the 1950s, fish farms indicated by the yellow were providing very little, if any of the fish that people were eating. Now, fish farms provide about half of all seafood consumed. And because wild capture fisheries peaked years ago, virtually any increase from now on will have to come from fish farms. Fish farms uh, can be hit or miss. It's hard to make a sweeping conclusion and say they're all good or all bad. You have to look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. Some are doing things a lot better. Some essentially become aquatic CAFOs. A few ideas for sustainable seafood consumption. Aim for less fish and a wider variety. Aim for lower on the food chain if possible. Filter feeders can offer some ecosystem benefits like mussels and oysters. Aim, aiming for locally caught and raised when possible. And then don't forget about sea vegetables. All right, dietary adjustment number one is a biggie. Uh, moving on to number two, minimize wasted food. Americans threw away five billion eggs last year. That's enough to make an omelet the size of Reading. I formally apologize on behalf of all Americans. At the end of the Great Depression in 1939, households in Britain were wasting about 3% of their groceries. 
now households in the UK are throwing away about 20% of their groceries. So essentially, if somebody in the UK goes grocery shopping and they're carrying home five bags of groceries, one of those bags is going to end up in the trash. This is the food supply chain from farm to fork. In developing countries, the majority of food losses tend to occur early in the food supply chain, on the farm, during transport. In developed countries, it's quite the opposite. The majority of food is being lost or wasted at the retail end or at the consumer level. Various factors play a role in this. One factor, as incomes rise, people tend to eat a wider variety of fresh food flown in from many different places, vegetables, fruits, seafood, dairy, eggs. These foods have a short shelf life. If we don't use them soon, they will go bad and we can't use them, so they might be discarded by somebody. Another factor, confusion with the best buy dates printed on packages. So if you buy a food, it has a date printed on it. Some people don't know if this is a quality thing, a safety thing, a freshness thing. They might panic and throw it away. It might be perfectly fine. There are some efforts in certain countries to streamline the dates printed on these packages. And a final big factor, not eating leftovers. I would suspect that a big part of this in developed countries is related to our fundamental disconnect from food. We're not as connected to food as we used to be. And in developing countries where more people are working in agriculture, they have a better sense of the amount of time and energy and resources that goes into food and in developed countries, not, not so much. What motivates people in the US to waste less food? The number one response, save money. Last place, uh, concern for the environment. <laughs> I formally apologize on behalf of all Americans. Wasted food is a double environmental whammy. Environmental whammy number one, when food is discarded, we're discarding all the resources that went into producing that food. 21% of all freshwater, 19% of all fertilizer, 18% of all cropland, 21% of all landfill volume. That's devoted to food we never consume, food that's lost or wasted. Environmental whammy number two, food that enters the landfill breaks down and releases greenhouse gases. We're not just talking about a forgettable amount. If wasted food were represented as a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter behind the US and China. Beyond the fact of wasted food contributing to environmental issues, consider this, if we were able to retrieve 50% of our wasted food, we'd be able to feed an additional 1 billion people. While plenty of food is wasted at home, we also see food waste at grocery stores and specifically fresh produce, vegetables, fruits that don't look a certain way. And we won't buy fruits and vegetables as eaters with the most minuscule blemishes. This is one of the reasons for high supermarket tur turnover. It's always fascinating to me in the US how picky we get with fresh produce. We are quick to reject the crooked carrot and the bruised banana, but we are the same people who are one-handing Go-Gurts and Big Macs while driving to work. All sorts of different strategies for minimizing wasted food. Planning meals goes a long way, taking leftovers home, eating the leftovers, being willing to buy the blemished produce, donating food that you're not going to use, taking food scraps to farms for livestock, getting involved in composting if possible, uh, getting clear on the best buy dates, avoiding really big packages you're not gonna use. And if anybody's involved with schools, scheduling recess before lunch can reduce plate waste by 30%. Dietary adjustment number three, support sustainable farms. In many cases, this includes locally grown or organically grown food. The farmer whose soil produces less every year is unkind to it in some way. That is, he is not doing it what he should, he is robbing it of some substance it must have, and he becomes therefore a soil robber rather than a progressive farmer. My man, George Washington Carver, was a pioneer for regenerative agriculture in the US. I always think of soil like a savings account. The more you deposit now, the more you're going to have later on. If you're only making withdrawals, you'll eventually deplete your account and you become a soil robber. Stated in another way, by Project Drawdown, the world cannot be fed unless the soil is fed. The intention behind sustainable farming practices is to build a robust soil savings account, making sure it's full of organic matter. And this is done through various practices. Some of them circle, uh, you can see here highlighted with the blue circle. Crop rotation, adding compost and green manures, planting cover crops, minimal tillage, crop and livestock diversity. These techniques have been around for thousands of years and they were practiced widely until the mid 1900s. Industrialized farming through the overapplication of synthetic chemicals and monocropping and overgrazing and overtilling, they're constantly robbing the soil. And this degraded land is probably not going to be productive and probably not going to be resilient. The agricultural debate often doesn't make it much further than organic versus conventional, at least in the US. 
but it's probably going to take some of the tried and true traditional farming techniques along with some of the latest and greatest agricultural technology. As Dan Barber says, the best kind of farming cannot be reduced to a set of rules. I tend to agree. While agriculture includes many practices that we could break down and spend time on, I'm gonna call out two biggies, fertilizers and pesticides. First off, fertilizers. You can see that back in the 1960s, total fertilizer production started to skyrocket and it continues to increase. The fertilizer that's had the largest increase, synthetic nitrogen rich fertilizers. Food crops need nitrogen to grow. Sustainable farmers tend to get this nitrogen via cover crops and through uh, manure from animals. Industrialized conventional farmers get their nitrogen from synthetic nitrogen rich fertilizers. When these fertilizers are applied, 30 to 80% of the nitrogen escapes into water and air. This nitrogen escapes like the glitter in one of these arts and crafts projects. It goes everywhere and creates a mess. Maybe you have made an art project like this. Cue toxic algae overgrowths and aquatic dead zones when you have all of this fertilizer escaping. Phosphorus fertilizers also present problems. This is an aerial photograph of the world's longest conveyor belt. It's 61 miles long and it's transporting phosphorus mined from mineral deposits across the Western Sahara to a port near the Atlantic Ocean. Much of this phosphorus will go, go towards the creation of fertilizers. The supply of phosphorus on planet Earth is finite. Resources are expected to become scarce in the next 50 to 100 years. And just like nitrogen, there's a spillover effect with phosphorus rich fertilizers contributing to toxic algae overgrowth and dead zones. The other big agricultural issue is pesticides. Pesticides are used to eliminate pests, and I'm talking all potential pests, insects, fungi, weeds, etc. Use of pesticides in the United States has increased 33 fold since the 1940s. When pesticides are applied, they can go everywhere. They can enter water, air, soil, they can get into food, livestock, humans, wildlife, pollinators, and this can lead to overall diminished biodiversity. In China, bee populations are so low in certain areas due to the overuse of pesticides that farmers now have to pollinate by hand in some cases. That's the image you see here. Sustainable farming techniques rely on other practices and agrochemicals to fight pests. Another overlooked solution that falls under this category of supporting sustainable farms would be growing your own food. Think about how most people are accessing food in developed countries. There's a long sequence of events between where the food is grown and what eventually gets to your plate. Think about the benefits of maybe shortening one's food supply chain, either by going to a farmer's market, joining a CSA, or starting a garden in your backyard. Costs can go down, it can be empowering, you can be more connected to food, all sorts of potential benefits. Like Ron Finley says, growing your own food is like printing your own money. Some argue that having a more decentralized and unconsolidated food system will be essential to a more equitable and sustainable future. This is the goal of many urban agriculture projects. projects. Dietary adjustment number four, eat a wider variety of minimally processed foods. In part one, I talked about how the number one risk factor for death and disability is malnutrition in all of its forms. A theme throughout these two sub-risks are ultra-processed foods. Surely we're not eating that much ultra-processed food, right? I'm willing to bet that if you go and find a random adult living in the US, UK, Canada, and you follow that adult to the grocery store, and then you follow them around the grocery store and through the checkout line, observing what they buy, two things are gonna happen. The first is that you'll see a shopping cart packed more than half full with ultra processed foods. And the second is that you'll probably get arrested and issued a restraining order for following that person around so closely. Ultra processed foods are the elephant in the room. If you scroll through Instagram, you're gonna see people debating ketogenic diets, raw versus pasteurized milk, and the proper way to soak chia seeds. Meanwhile, I'm lying in bed at night just thinking about how everybody's diet is built around cinnamon toast crunch and hot pockets. Okay, so people in the UK eat a lot of processed foods. How are they doing with overall dietary variety? About 50% of vegetable intake in the UK is from potatoes, tomatoes, and lettuce. I love tots and ketchup as much as the next person, but this limited variety with dietary choices has all sorts of repercussions on food security, economic stability, nutrient intake, and the environment. 
Eating a varied diet is one of the most important things we can do for a sustainable food system. Eating a variety of foods is a quadruple win scenario. It's good for our health, good for plant pollinators, good for soil microbes, and good for all good for overall ecosystem productivity and resilience. The fifth and final dietary adjustment, minimize single use plastics. Plastic food and beverage packaging is wonderful and it's terrible. It's wonderful because modern plastic packaging provides a barrier that can allow food to be shelf stable, transportable, and unlikely to become contaminated by things in the environment. It's terrible because it takes a lot of natural resources to create plastic and most of it is designed to be single use. And most people now know that recycling, quite frankly, stinks. 6% of global oil is going towards the production of plastics. This is equivalent to the oil consumption of the global aviation sector. And it's expected that by 2050, 20% of global oil will be going to production of plastics. I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit this. I did not know the plastic was derived from petroleum or natural gas until my early 20s. For the first two decades of my life, Plastic was just something that my protein powder came in. That was about it. When we use plastic once and then dispose of it, it can often make its way into oceans or other bodies of water. In fact, nearly 8 million tons of plastics enter the ocean each year. Much of it we can't even see because it breaks down into microplastics. Plastic is so ubiquitous on planet Earth that it presents a threat to health for all. Here are five ideas for solutions to the plastic issue. Some simple, some complex. First off, build your street cred with reusables. Reusable shopping bags, water bottles, tea thermoses, utensils, straws, and so forth. I know, I hear you, I feel you. It's hard to imagine yourself breaking out a bamboo fork and stainless steel straw when you're out with friends at a cafe. You've gotta be next level cool to pull these off. Solution number two, develop deposit schemes to incentivize reuse. There's a company in Denmark that has developed a deposit scheme with coffee cups. You go and get a coffee cup, you put a deposit down, you return the coffee cup, you get your deposit back, and there's an app to sync everything up. Number three, ban certain items. Certain items, other than in emergency situations, we could probably do without plastic bags, straws, water bottles, et cetera. Solution four, urge or maybe require corporations to take more responsibility for the plastics that they are producing, some sort of taxation maybe. And then finally, mandate effective waste management infrastructure and legis legislation on fishing. You probably fell asleep as I was reading number five, I know, but it is very important. If you think about it, no matter the situation with plastics, if, if a country does not have the infrastructure in place to bring plastics to a landfill or to a recycling facility and the plastic just escapes into the environment and becomes a burden of pollution, that's a major problem. And with fishing, a lot of the plastic waste we're seeing about 20% in some areas of the ocean is plastic um, nets and lines and things from the fishing industry. All right, you know my five major takeaways from today. Find your minimal effective dose of animal products, be selective about where they come from, minimize wasted food, support sustainable farms, eat a wider variety of minimally processed foods, minimize single use plastics. And I'll leave you with two quotes. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. I love this quote. Take a minute to let this quote from Dr. Paul Batalden, a health policy expert, sink in. To me, this quote means that we're getting exactly the kind of results we should expect given the structure of our current food system. The optimistic angle here is that when we make sustainable changes to the food system, we'll get sustainable results. So in that sense, there's some hope. And then here's a mic drop worthy quote from Heal Food Alliance. Food is our most intimate and powerful connection to each other, to our cultures and to the earth. And to transform our food system is to take one giant step towards healing our bodies, our economy and our environment. The last few years have been a great time to learn about the food system. And I will make sure to post slides and the slides have links to these different resources if you are interested. Uh, this is another one. And Thank you very much for your time and attention. I know this is a lot to take in. Very much appreciated. Happy to open it up to uh, any discussion or questions at this point. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan, for the excellent and practical presentation. And I wanted to ask you about how the five dietary adjustments link to 
food choices sustainability because they go beyond just food choices and practices. And in particular, I was curious about these five dietary lens in relation to the other topics of your book. If it's, if I'm pronounced it correctly, it's called Swole Planet because you also talk about fitness at this point. So I was curious to reveal this whole systems picture when you when you talk about the five dietary lenses in relation to the other topics of the book, if you could tell us a little bit more about that, please. Yeah. Um, so basically, I, my hope with these adjustments with the book is to uh, bridge the gap between swollenness and sustainability or helping people build a better body and a, and a better earth. So what behaviors can we do that not only support our fitness and our performance and our health and minimize disease, but also can benefit ecosystems, can also uh, improve the situation for farm workers, can also improve the situation for animals, can also be a nudge towards uh, food equity. Um, and through many different avenues, I, I do feel that these five adjustments uh, are in some cases, a big step. In some cases, it may be a small step. In some cases, just kind of a minor nudge, but in the direction of a more sustainable and equitable food system. Great. Thank you so much. I will post this video for the rest of the community to see, and I want to thank you again for the excellent and practical presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.